Hello, I'm Dr. Gail Randall and today on my Instagram Live we're going to talk about cognitive decline, prevention and treatment. Now when I mean by treatment it's more like delaying it but treatment that really does work. So I get, if you notice I may have given a similar talk many months ago but what I love about today's age and being in this area of medicine and, and health is that things change and new research comes out and then we need to talk about that. So there is new research and we do need to talk about it because it's, it's really important. Okay, the, the previous talk had research, it's still valid, but this is um, really pertinent because we're talking about 2020-2021 research so it's fabulous. I'm, I'm always happy to incorporate new information into my toolbox. The more I can know the more I can help my people. So anyway let's talk about it. Uh, I want to give some credits here before we get going. Um, I want to credit Emron Meyer and his book The Mind Gut Connection and I want to credit the Institute for Functional Medicine for some of the information. I want to credit Dale Bredenson and his book, The End of Alzheimer's Disease, and my own book, Soul Doctoring, Heal Yourself, Heal the Planet, at Chapter 21, which is Healthy Brain. So all of those contributions are in this talk. Don't worry, we're not going <laughs> to, it's not going to take three hours. So, um, you know, what's happening, if you look around, we're all living longer, which is partly a good thing, but in addition to living longer, there's an increased population, and, an, and this increased life expectancy is leading to an increased incidence of cognitive decline. And why is that? Well, we have over a billion people in this world that have chronic disease, secondary to poor lifestyle, and particularly in this country, it astounds me that we have people that are, you know, dying from nutrient deficiencies. Basically not because they can't get food, but because they're making poor choices. But this poor nutrition, poor lifestyle is leading to chronic disease in, in over a billion people. And that is a, pre, is a predisposition for cognitive decline in many cases, and we'll talk about that. In the United States, there's over 5 million people with cognitive decline, and by 2050, that's supposed to be 16 million. Worldwide, it's 50 million. And by year 2030, it's going to be 82 million people. How are we going to take care of those people? Better yet, let's prevent it. Let's do the things we need to do, improve our lifestyle, our diet, and exercise, and that can go a long way towards prevention and delaying this, this cognitive decline. The other thing is <clears throat> to take into consideration is the COVID epidemic, pandemic, had increased, boosted the number of cases and magnified the severity because of the isolation and also the mental health issues. So that's all sort of in the same category, so we need to consider that as well. A great portion of these people can be prevented with the right diet and the right lifestyle. The consensus is that drugs really don't work for cognitive decline because there's so many variables, so many factors, and I'm going to talk about some of the different types of cognitive decline. It, one size does not fit all here. One size does not fit all. So that's why the drugs aren't working. It's not that they're bad drugs. It's just they can't cover everybody. And so it's, it rarely works. Uh, recent research has confirmed that the approach of nutrition is key and lifestyle is the combined with that is even better. So it can uh, reduce the occurrence of cognitive decline and delay the occurrence. So um, 
Nutrient-dense anti-inflammatory diets have been associated with a decreased risk in chronic disease. So from that, these people took that information and said, well, cognitive decline comes from chronic diseases, so let's see what it does for that. So it turns out that diets high in phy phytochemicals, antioxidants are neuroprotective and they support the cognition and they slow neurogeneration excuse me, neurodegeneration. Epidemiologic studies have shown that diets high in plant-based, whole grain, and healthy foods based on a Mediterranean and DASH diets are associated with less cognitive decline. Let's get into that a little deeper. So there's a recent study in 2021, that's pretty recent, that's where we are right now, that's looked at a Mediterranean diet and cognitive and also psychological state. It was over 2,000 people, both men and women, over the age of 65 years. Now, if you're, if you're younger than 65 years, don't turn off because the sooner you start on this good diet, good lifestyle, the less chance you're going to have to express cognitive decline and uh, dementia, and that's not anything that any of us want. You know, when people hear that, they run. It's equivalent to cancer, really, when people, you know, the, the, the scariness of it. So what they did is they studied it. They, put, they looked at people who were on a Mediterranean DASH diet, and they found that in addition to increasing their performance, the nutrition also has been shown to increase brain structure. For example, polyphenols in foods. Polyphenols are, are the kind of food, they're super duper antioxidants that come in things like pomegranates and avocados and flavonoids, things like quercetin, res resveratrol, and egallic acid in berries, oregano and cacao, nuts, uh, and olive oil all have these very important nutrients in them and we need to seek out those like on a regular basis. The polyphenols protect the microglial cells. Now you're going like, what are those? Well, I remember from my schooling hearing microglial cells as referred to as the farmers of the brain cells. And I never forgot that because I, I'm thinking, oh, we want those. So what they do, they're like macrophages in your regular uh, circulation, which are big cells which go in and eat up the detritus or bad infl inflammatory cells and take them out of the equation. Well, it's the same thing only in your central nervous system. They're macrophage-like cells which remove damaged neurons and infections and... Um, improve the CNS and overall and are, have to be there to maintain the, the central nervous system cells. So they're the farmers of our central nervous system cells and our brain cells. So they have the, so um, they have a major role in that. Also this kind of diet, the Mediterranean DASH diet, um, as opposed to the poor nutrition for instance, the standard American diet full of meats and sugar and high fructose corn syrup showed with that diet, it decreased hippocampal volume. Now what the hippocampus is key for memory and for learning. So we need our hippocampus. So the, the sad American diet is not good for our hippocampus. And that's, you know, that's what our parents ate. You know, they ate steaks every day, they ate baked potatoes, not that those are bad in and of themselves, but lots of bread, lots of alcohol, lots of sugar. And then, you know, they didn't fare so well in the brain department later on, and that's probably why. So things like increased omega-3s from, everybody thinks fish, but also you can get omega-3s from wheatgrass, pigweed, and algae. Algae oil is equivalent to fish oil for omega-3s, and I highly recommend it. 
and that increases white matter integrity and gray matter and white matter volume. So we want our omega-3s on a regular basis. Another recent study in 2020 in the, the journal called Aging and um, Aging Research and Review, they looked at 14 different studies and they kind of overlaid them to come up with this data. And again, they were studying the Mediterranean diet, but they also looked at neuroimaging and, neuro, and neurocognition, in other words, cognitive function. And then I found that the, the higher the adherence to a Mediterranean diet, the higher the um, total and regional brain volumes. You know, we always see on people, older people's brain scans that their volume has decreased. Maybe it doesn't have to. Or if it has, how do we keep it, you know, steady so we don't lose any more volume? Well, Mediterranean diet with lots of polyphenols, as we discussed already, lots of olive oil, and lots of plant matter. The, and then also, the increased adherence to the Mediterranean diet showed a decrease in microstructural changes or degeneration and an increase in cognitive function. The decreased adherence showed increased amyloid. Now, you've probably heard about this, amyloid plaques. Uh, and this was in the frontal and, and parietal lobes, but amyloid is a substance that's laid down in the brain and it clogs things up. So it doesn't allow your nerves to conduct. It's like a roadblock. Not a good thing. What's really interesting, I'm just going to bring this up now because I heard this in a lecture. I go to all these brain lectures that even if you have amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles, if you ha have a high brain-derived neurotropic factor, it's an RNA, brain-derived BDNF. You might have heard it as something that's a very hot subject for the last few years. The higher that your BDNF, even if you have plaques, even if you have neurofibrillary tangles, you don't express the cognitive decline because the BDNF, it's, it goes around it. It's like it doesn't care. It's, it's to keep your function of your brain. Now, what increases BDNF? Exercise. Exercise is the number one thing that increases your BDNF. Also, uh, sage and rosemary, they, the high, highly mentholated herbs, help your BDNF. And the thing that I love the most is coffee fruit. Now, we people have been drinking coffee for years, but the fruit, they throw away. This beautiful red fruit that the coffee bean comes out of, that's where the magic is. So now they're making supplements with coffee fruit in it because it increases your BDNF. So there's one, uh, there's a couple of them. You know, one is a, is a powder type drink from Pure. Another one is uh, from Bulletproof and it's called um, Neuromaster. So there's a, and I'm sure there's others now, but those are the two to mention. So also, um, the increased adherence to the Mediterranean diet showed an increase in gray matter and white matter volume. So I think we should be eating the Mediterranean diet, don't you? And then they also showed that if you eat, the more meat that people ate, they had a decrease in gray matter volume and an increase in amyloid plaques. These are things we don't want. Overall, the findings were the Mediterranean diet plus vitamins, plus antioxidants, plus fiber, increased white matter and gray matter, integrity, volume, increased functional connectivity, and total and regional brain volumes, and also increases glucose metabolism. So that's fabulous. Now let's talk a little bit about the gut microbiome. Of course, we knew we were gonna to get to that with me, right? So, you know, check out Emron Meyer's Mind Gut book. He talks about this, but it turns out, of course, that the optimal microbiome improves brain function. So what do we mean optimal microbiome? In a 2020 study of 200, about 225 people, they looked at the um, stool test to see what the microbiome was, and they looked at, at cognition, and they found that increased plant-based food resulted in an a, increase in anti-inflammatory microbiome. 
increased plant-based, increased anti-inflammatory microbiome, increased inflammatory microbiome. So, you know, if you want to eat meat, you know, just make it balanced, have it be regeneratively farmed, which has a lot of phytonutrients and not super often. And then you won't shift your microbiome. So I'm going to talk, I'm going to actually tell you about all the, the nutrients that are helpful at the end. But first I want to talk a little bit about Dale Bredesen's system of categorizing different types of Alzheimer's disease and different types of cognitive decline. First of all, there's inflammatory or hot. So it's either infectious, autoimmune, or gut related. Now the infectious part really fascinates me because you can be walking around with an infection in your brain and you don't even know it. When I go to these conferences, I've often seen pictures of plaques in the brain there and then right next to the brain is a viral particle. So it's very indicative that virus such as herpes or things you may not know you have like CMV or even EBV could go to the brain and cause plaques. So if you're having cognitive decline, I mean, I always check viral titers on my patients. So you know, if you, if you, I ask the patients, do you get um, cold sores or, or herpes on your lip or in your mouth? So these are all things to check into. Autoimmune disease, a person usually knows they have it. If not, you can run a panel to check it out. You can get an ANA to look for lupus. You can get a rheumatoid factor to look for that. And then gut related, like we already just talked about. The second one is glycotoxic. This is huge, huge, huge. Overall, one of the biggest injuries to the brain is sugar. So it's called glycotoxic and it's insulin resistance or insulin that damages the brain more than even sugar. Insulin damages the brain by decreasing the enzyme that breaks down the amyloid. So you get the amyloid plaques again. So you want it on, on your people, if you're a doctor or if you just want to know if you have it, you want to make sure your hemoglobin A1C is good. I like less than 5.5, that your blood sugar and insulin levels are not high. And of course, dietarily, you want to avoid overt sugar refined carbohydrates like cookies and biscuits and cake and make it a sometimes food so that you don't spike your blood sugar and put your brain at risk. The third type is called atrophic or cold or hormonal and it's often related to nutrient depletion and you don't you want to make sure and and your hormones so you want to check your thyroid you want to check your sex hormones and make sure you're not planked out and um, that's the way to tell that. The, the next one is toxic or vile and so you want to look for heavy metals or other toxins like glyphosates for instance. So there's ways of doing that and I'm going to tell you that in a minute. The fifth one is vascular and that often goes along with diabetes with a decreased microvascular uh, supply but it's not just diabetes. People get little multi-infarct dimension, and that comes from a poor lifestyle. So again, you want to make sure your cholesterol is in good shape, that you're exercising and your lifestyle is good. And the last one is trauma traumatic, and it you can be either from PTSD directly from trauma or emotional trauma or head trauma. So you, you look for a history of that. Okay, so the tools that I use to assess my patients when they come in with cognitive decline, first of all, a really good history. Second of all, I want to know what is their metabolism. You know, they may, a lot of people, this is so classic, they come in, I go, how's your diet? It's fine. <laughs> I go, well, what does that mean to you? You know, what, and so I really get detailed. I say, what do you eat? Let's go through it. What do you eat for breakfast? What do you eat for lunch? What do you eat for dinner? And I look for little things that are going to give me a clue 
whether they're spiking their blood sugar or their insulin levels because that's the most damaging thing. Or, you know, if they're eating a lot, a lot of fish, they could have mercury toxicity. And that's, of course, a heavy metal. And that might not be helping them out. So I ask all these questions. And then I do what's called a Genova. I also ask them, are they exercising? Because exercise is key. Remember I told you what does exercise do? Increase your brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It also clears toxins. When you sweat and you really pump it, you know, you're, you're detoxing and you're clearing heavy metals and other toxins from your body. And I ask them, do you eat organic? Because if you eat organic, you're not going to be full of glyphosates or Monsanto. So that's, those are the really key questions. You know, I ask them, do you eat meat? Because if you don't eat any meat at all and you don't take B12, then you, you could have a B12 deficiency. Do you, do you take vitamin D? Which we all should take probably vitamin D. Almost everybody needs vitamin D because it's anti-inflammatory. And one of the biggest ways to get cognitive decline is inflammation. So, um, so I do a Genova diagnostic test or a spectrocell test, which will tell me what are their nutrients. It'll tell me, do they have heavy metals or not? And then I know, oh, do we have to clear them? So if you eat a lot of fish, you want to look for mercury. If, you, if you've lived as a child in an old house, you could have lead toxicity. And um, also tin and aluminum tend to be problems with cognitive decline. So we want to do these tests. We want to see what the heavy metals are. And then we also want to see what is the glutathione level. Because the glutathione is the number one detoxification molecule in your body. And you have to have it to clear heavy metals. Because one another way to get cognitive decline is have metabolic um, deficiencies or genetic problems of metabolism, like a MTHFR, if you're not making enough folate, you're not going to detoxify well, you know, if you're, um, and there's different metabolic errors that could happen, so you want to check for those. You don't want to get a home because that would give me a clue as to how their metabolism is working. I want to get a mercury level if we don't do the Genova or Spectra cell. And then viral titers, as I mentioned before, because if someone has a hidden occult virus or um, a stealth organism, as I call them, they can have, uh, you can pick it up on the viral titers. I want to check a hemoglobin A1C and a glucose, I think. And then also for the inflammation, you want to get a CRP, which is a C-reactive protein, and a set rate. So th these are all things that can lead us to the answers of how we want to design the program for the person. We know overall everybody needs a good diet, overall everybody needs a good exer exercise plan, and in addition to that they need like a spiritual practice and a de-stressing program because and a good attitude and those things can help them. So if they have a, a problem with their mental health we want to make sure that they're doing these kind of programs or meditations to get their attitude good because that's one of the best things no matter what you have to heal you is to have a good attitude. I also do what's called a GI map test which is an RNA to DNA test which defines the entire microbiome because we want to see is their microbiome leaning towards inflammatory or is their microbiome not? Do they have a leaky gut? because that's going to lead to a cognition problem simply by leaking stuff across and causing inflammation in the body. And once again, I mentioned the hemoglobin A1C and insulin levels. So those are the important tools for testing. One thing I didn't mention is in people with the mental problems, even in people with cognitive decline, I like to check their neurotransmitters and their cortisol levels. Cor cor you know, cortisol can be very damaging to the brain as well, and if your neurotransmitters are not adequate, you're not going to be thinking well as well, and you're not going to handle stress well. And stress 
is very, I think the chemicals from stress are as bad as the chemicals from our environment. So we want to see what are the, you know, the serotonin and the GABA being the buffers to stress. We want to see what those levels are. We want to see what the norepinephrine, epinephrine, glutamate, PEA are because they're, they're the stimulatory neurotransmitters that can result, excuse me, from high stress levels and they can be very damaging to the brain and the body. So, and if they, we do find it, there are natural ways to treat that. We have targeted amino acid therapy that we can do to increase serotonin and GABA and dopamine. And for the cortisol, we, we can give herbs and things to decrease spiking cortisol levels, or if it's too low, we can give other herbs to bring it up. So that's a wonderful program. I use um, Sinesco's test and supplements mostly for that. And uh, that is, I've helped literally thousands of people with that technique. I have a few case studies also I wanted to uh, tell you about, but in general, we want to fo focus more on high protein, low carb, good fat, brain foods such as blueberries, avocado, olive oil, cruciferous vegetables, dark chocolate, green tea because of the agallic acid in there, turmeric. Now I prefer the water soluble kind of turmeric because you want to get it in your brain or whatever results in the highest amount of free curcuminoids in your bloodstream. Uh, celery, celery juice, pumpkin, sunflower, pumpkin seeds, because they have the omega-7s in them, which you really don't get anywhere else other than seeds or maybe sunflower sprouts. Beets, spinach, leafy greens, oranges, legumes, almonds, sage, I'm getting hungry, rosemary, tomatoes, and lots of water. Drink half your weight in water in ounces a day. Because dehydration is not good for your brain cells either. So I had a, a gentleman, he was in his late 70s. And he came in to me for a number of years. He was my patient for more than 10 years. He, ha he was brilliant. He was a brilliant lawyer in his time. He had an IQ of 180 um, in his time. And he would come in and tell me the same story every day. I'd say, so, how are you doing, Chris? He'd say, I'm old. I'd say, okay. He says, well, I'm pretty good. I can still win at bridge. And I, w I make a lot of money on the internet, on the stock market. So it tells me that a certain part of his brain is working. But he says, you know, I, I usually can't remember people's names. And I oftentimes can't find my car. So I'd ask him, well, are you ready to do some programming for this? Or, and he generally would tell me no. But this one day he came in and he said yes. And I'm like, hooray, yes. <laughs> so I asked him, so are you willing to exercise? Just walk 30 minutes, three times a week? And he said, yeah, he'd do it. And so I put him on a number of uh, supplements, including the, um, the coffee fruit extract, supplement that I told you about, but I put them on fish oil. I put them on um, <clears throat> uh, the phytonutrient a, a capsule that's very potent called uh, Vitanox from uh, Standard Process. <clears throat> and I got him to actually do breathing exercises to decrease his stress because he was very stressed out. He'd lost his he had a number of ex-wives that had died and it was very, stressing him out very much. So he agreed to do it. And um, I also put him on um, turmeric, the water-soluble kind of turmeric, and magnesium 3 and 8 because that gets across the blood-brain barrier. And magnesium catalyzes over 300 metabolic reactions in your body and is very keen in brain function and some ginkgo to increase his micro microcirculation. And he was willing to go that far and also resveratrol. So resveratrol is really cool because it not only helps your brain function, it's a super duper antioxidant. It comes from those things like berries and blueberries and it's, a, it's like a polyphenol, but if 
on the ends, it increases those little things at the ends of your chromosomes called telomeres. And telomeres, if you have long tel telomeres, you live longer. So it helps that happen in addition to exercise and other things. So he did all that for about three months. He came back and I said, so how are you doing, Chris? He says, well, I'm still old. <laughs> so, okay. He says, but I can, I'm remembering names better and I'm not losing my car. So that was a significant improvement, I thought, for him. And um, he was still playing bridge and doing well, and he was still winning on the stock market, on the Internet. So that's a, a good end. And now he's in his 80s, and he's still doing well. So it does help to have a good lifestyle, to have a good diet, and to ingest the right things. So I suggest we all do it and start together today. All right, is there any questions or anything I didn't cover? Anybody want to ask me any questions about what I just presented or? I put up a, a post which included most of the nutrients recently on my Instagram, which included most of the nutrients that I mentioned, although I didn't include one of them and I do need to talk to you about it. It's, and it's the new kid on the block actually. And it is very important, so I'm glad I'm going to answer my own question. There's a new one, and it didn't used to get much attention, but it's called NAD. It's nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. And it turns out that it is very important in brain function, and not just brain function, but whole metabol or whole metabolism depends on it. Every mitochondria in your whole body needs NAD. It it helps uh, not just with energy, because the mitochondria make energy, but they also are very key for detoxification. But it's also very key for control of free radicals, those things that damage our DNA, and for the number of mitochondria that you have in your body and your brain. So if you're over 65 or even younger and you're feeling fatigued, I recommend going on some NAD. Okay, that was a good place to, but I included that because that's so important. Okay, I talked fast. Let's see, how much meat should you eat? Well, um, you know, everybody's different, but I, I re industrialized meat, I would say you shouldn't eat any because it's highly inflammatory, causes diabetes, and it causes um, inflammation in your body. But if you get meat from uh, a source like a regeneratively farmed meat, it's full of phytonutrients. This is how it works. I've explained this before, but they, they, they mimic the predator-prey relationship. So they have a herd of cattle. They start them on a certain hectare of land, and they allow them to eat the grass only to halfway down. Then they mimic the predator, and they move them to another hectare of land. Same thing, and they keep moving them, and they don't get back to that first hectare of land for maybe a year. That's how the buffalo roamed. So when the buffalo came through, it was approximately every year. They'd graze here, and then they'd graze over there because the predators would come, and they'd move. And that's how they roamed, and that's how they grazed. And it, it actually improved the grasslands because their poop and their pee and they would roam about and then their hooves would work it into the land and the grass became more robust. Same thing with the regenerative farmer. Same thing with their grasses. The grasses become more robust. In addition, those grasses pull down carbon from the atmosphere. So it's good for the planet. So raising that regeneratively farmed meat is actually good for the planet and it's good for you. It's the best kind. So, you know, there's no way to know how much, but it, with that kind of meat, without chemicals, and with those in, increased nutrients, you know, you it, it's still like maybe three times a week or whatever you can afford. But any other questions? Yes, of course, it's organic, too. Organic is very important because it is the toxins in meat or anything else that 
is what causes cognitive decline or chronic disease. Yes, uh, God gave us a body that can make protein out of plants. And if you want to just eat vegetables, you can do that. You know, how do you think the cow does it? How do you think the cow makes meat? How do you think the silverback gorilla makes meat? It only eats bamboo shoots. So, you know, I do think we need some... We, it's all about amino acids, really. So, in the, in the vegan or the vegetarian, I recommend uh, soy organic, again, because then you don't get into problems there, and uh, pea plant protein or legumes, any kind of legumes, and you just soak them overnight. It takes off those lectins, Dr. Gundry, so it doesn't bother anybody, and um, you get plenty of protein and amino acids. You don't have to eat meat to make meat. A lot of people think you do. It's a misnomer. Our metabolism can do it. No, all, all turmeric over the counter is not not water soluble. As a matter of fact, it's not water soluble. It, it stays in your gut, which is a good thing because if you have any inflammation in your gut, that's a good. It helps that, but you want the, there's all, also if you do fat soluble like the one I have on Randall Wellness, that gets into the bloodstream because it goes through the gut, the fat of the cells and gets into the bloodstream. But the highest level a free curcuminoids comes from a water-soluble turmeric. You're welcome. Anything else? Okay, I love questions. <laughs> okay, if there was something you wanted to ask me and you didn't get a chance, please uh, message me on my Instagram and I will answer all my questions. All right, take care of you. Eat a Mediterranean diet as much as possible. And, you know, the fit, the oceans are sort of struggling, and that's why I mentioned you can get omega-3s from uh, algae oil and pigweed and grasses, and you don't have to eat the fish because they're very toxic right now, and they're struggling. And I guess if we don't lay off the industrialized fishing, we're not going to have any fish by the year. 2048 and that's that's not going to work won't survive so i'm just saying i'm not saying don't eat it of course as as a diet it's really very good for you but the fish isn't what it was back in the day so it needs a pause and they've shown that if you do decrease that type of fishing in that area the fish will increase and the fishermen that are tradition that are traditionally fishing get more fish so that's what we need to do. We need to lobby with your your senator, your whatever you have to do. Uh, the, the What I say is go around it. The only way we can really do it is if we just don't, we boycott it and we don't eat it. Because they won't catch it if we don't eat it. There's no, there's no financial benefit to it. It's a, really a sometimes thing. If you want to get a salmon and have it for Christmas or your birthday or whatever, fine, you know, but we have the least number of salmon right now than we've ever had. And we need the fish. It's actually the swimming ocean of the fit, the swimming motion of the fish that keeps the CO, there's more CO2 in the, harbored in the ocean than anywhere. And if we don't have those fish, that swimming motion, which is astounding to me, it won't keep that CO2 harbored anymore. And then it will do what? It gets released. It's going to add to our carbon debt, and our global warming is already near its limit. So I say just give it a pause, and then we can get back to it. Okay. Well, I'm sorry you just got here, Julia, but we're kind of done right now. <laughs> is there anything you wanted to ask before I go? All right, I love you guys. Tune in next week for another Instagram Live. I'll be here. Okay, bye.